we have a crisis in the world, tremendous crisis, and also crisis in our consciousness, in us. I see the urgency of change, radical revolution, mutation in the mind. I see it. It is necessary. There is complete quietness of the mind, and that which is silent has vast space. Only then that which is nameless comes into being. This is Urgency of Change, the Krishnamurti podcast. Hello and welcome to episode 77 of Urgency of Change. Each weekly episode in this season of the Krishnamurti podcast is based on a major theme of the philosopher's talks, such as freedom, self-knowledge, beauty, intelligence and meditation. Extracts from our archives have been carefully selected to represent Krishnamurti's different approaches to each of these universal and timelessly relevant themes. This week's theme is beauty. Upcoming themes are compassion, death and thought. This is a podcast from Krishnamurti Foundation Trust. For more information about our activities and programmes, such as our volunteer programme at Brockwood Park in the UK, we are online at kfoundation.org. You can also find our daily quotes and videos on Instagram and Facebook at Krishnamurti Foundation Trust. This week's podcast has five sections. The first extract is from Krishnamurti's fifth talk in Sanan, 1982, titled, What is Beauty? Here, whole civilization, whether in the East or in the West, has been the investigation of the external, making the external as pleasant, as agreeable, as comfortable and so on. Making the external beautiful, beautiful house, beautiful furniture, a lovely garden, beautiful clothes, that's a marvellous painting. That's really quite an extraordinary poem. The great cathedrals, the temples and so on. So we, <coughs> a beautiful woman and man and so on, external, making the external as perfect as possible, as accurate as possible. If you lived in this part of the country, you will see their mechanical things are extraordinarily lasting. You don't have to call the plumber every other day. Here they endure. So, our history, which is the story of mankind, and that mankind is you, it is, history is the story of yourself. And we have made the external as so-called beautiful as possible. If you see the, an, an aeroplane, it's really extraordinarily beautiful. Or a dynamo. And a marvellous bridge, expanding vast waters. So is that beauty? It's partly. When you see a mountain against the blue sky, the shadows, the valley, the rivers, 
That is an astonishing sight. So on Mars, what is beauty? Is there beauty without having inner beauty? You understand? We go into the word beauty presently. You may have a beautiful face, beautiful body, proportion, good eyes and all the rest of it. And the external beauty of a person is nice, attractive, pleasant. And is that beauty, without understanding the depth and the meaning of beauty? You follow? Are we together in this? Oh no. Yes? Well, somebody agree with me, please. <laughs> and I'm not talking to myself. So what is beauty? Is it only in the external world? And can there be beauty in the external world without understanding the beauty of life in oneself. Right? So we are inquiring together, please I must emphasize, together, cooperating together to find out what is beauty. Not according to the magazines, not what the artistic authorities say what is beauty, but to understand for ourselves the nature of beauty. Because without that, love cannot be. Has beauty a cause? As, as love has no cause, as intelligence has no cause, which we went into previously, has beauty a cause? So we are going to inquire if there is a cause to beauty, you understand? Know, cause. When you see something extraordinarily great, marvelous, majestic. What is your response to it? You observe it, if you are all at all aware of something external, what is taking place, you say, how strong, how beautiful that is. Let's go and have tea. Then such a response is very, very superficial. The second extract is from the fourth talk in Sanin, 1985, titled Is it beauty when you're absorbed by something? Such a lovely morning. Beautiful. Clear blue sky. The quiet hills. And the deep shadows. And the running water. The grove and the green grass. We ought to also should talk over together what is beauty. 
on such a lovely morning, could we talk about what is beauty? Well, that's a very important question. Not the beauty of the of nature or the extraordinary vitality, dynamic energy of a tiger. You have only seen tigers in a zoo. But the poor things are kept there for your amusement. If you go to some parts of the world, as the speaker has done, he was close to a wild tiger, as close as two feet away. Don't get excited. And we should also go into this question with the cause, with how beauty and love. There is no truth and we all ought to examine very closely the word beauty. What is beauty? You are asking that question and so is the speaker asking that question. So we are both together looking not only at the world, the implications of that world and the immensity, the incalculable depth of beauty. Should we talk about it? We can talk about it, but the talk, the words, the explanations and the descriptions are not beauty. The word beauty is not beauty. It is something totally different. So one must be, if one, if one may point it out, one must be very alert to words. Because our brain works, is active in a movement of words. Words convey what one feels, what one thinks, and accepts the explanations, descriptions, because our whole brain structure, most of it, is verbal. So one must go into it very, very carefully, not only with regard to beauty, but also with regard to austerity. with regard to self-interest. We are going to go into all these questions this morning, if we will. So we are asking ourselves, what is beauty? Is the beauty in a person, in a face. It's beauty in the music. In the museums, paintings, classical paintings, modern paintings. It's beauty in all the music, 
Beethoven, Mozart, Bach, and all the rest of them. Is beauty in a poem? In literature? Dancing? And all the noise that's going on in the world called music. Is all that beauty or is beauty something entirely different? Right? We are going into it together. Please don't be, if one may respectfully point out, don't accept the words. Merely be satisfied with description and explanation. Not agreeing and disagreeing, all that business. Let's put out, out all that, if we can, from our brain and look at it very carefully, stay with it, penetrate into the world. Because as we said, without that quality of beauty, which is sensitivity, which implies not only the beauty of nature, the deserts, the forests, the rivers, and the vast mountains with their immense dignity, majesty, but also the feeling, not the romantic imaginations and sentimental states, those are merely sensations. Is beauty, then we are asking, a sensation? Because we live by sensations. Sexual sensation, with which goes pleasure, and also the pain that's involved in the feeling that is not being fulfilled, and so on. If we could, this morning, put out all those words from our brain and look at, go into this enormous question, very complicated, subtle, what is the nature of beauty? We're not writing a poem. When you look at those mountains, those immense rocks jetting into the sky, If you look at it quietly, you feel the immensity of it, the enormous majesty of it. And for the moment, for the second, that tremendous dignity of it, the solidity of it, puts away all your thoughts, your problems for a second, right? And see how marvelous that is. So what has taken place there? The majesty of those mountains, for a second, the very immensity of the sky and the blue and the snow-clad mountains drive away 
all your problems. It makes you totally forget yourself for a second. You are enthralled by it, you are struck by it. Like a child who's been naughty all day long, or naughty for a while, which he has a right to be, and you give him a complicated toy. And he is absorbed by the toy till he breaks it up. And the toy has absorbed him. Yes. The toy has taken him over. And he's quiet, he's enjoying. Right? He's forgotten all his family, mother, oh, who do this, don't do that. And he's, the toy becomes the most exciting thing for him. You understand? The mountain, the river, the meadows, and the groves, absorb you. You forget yourself. Right? So, is that beauty? You understand? To be absorbed by the mountain, by the river, or the green fields. Or a, that means you are like a child being absorbed by something else. Right? And for the moment you are quiet. Right? Being absorbed, taken over, surrendering yourself to something. Is that beauty? Being taken over. You understand? Know Surrendering yourself to something great. And that thing forcing you for a second to forget yourself. So, when, when you depend, depend as the child does on a, on a toy, or depend on a cinema, television, and for the moment you are identified yourself with the actor or the actress. Surely all that is a form of being taken away from yourself, right? Would you consider that state being taken over, surrendering, being absorbed, that quiet second? Is that beauty? When you go to a church or a temple or a mosque, there the chanting, the rituals, the intonation of the voice, everything is so organized, so carefully put together to create certain sensation, which you call worship, which you call a sense of religiosity. Is that beauty? Oh, beauty is something entirely different. You understand? Are we understanding this question together? Is there beauty where there is self-conscious endeavor? Or 
There is beauty only when the self is not. When the need, the observer is not. So is it possible, without being absorbed, taken over, surrendering, to be in that state without the self, without the ego, the me always thinking about itself? You understand that? Is that possible at all? living in this modern world with all its specializations, with its vulgarity, this immense noise that's going on, not the noise of running waters, or the song of a bird, but is it possible to live in this world without the self, the me, the ego, the persona, the assertion of the individual. In that state when there is really freedom from all this, only then there is beauty. The third extract is from Krishnamurti's fourth talk in Madras, 1974, titled The Silence of a Quiet Mind is the Essence of Beauty. You know you can make mind quiet by taking a drug, by repeating a mantra or a word, constantly repeating, 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 naturally your mind will become quiet. And that such a mind is a dull, stupid mind. And you call that transcendental meditation or whatever you like to call it. And there is a silence between two noises. There is silence between two notes. There is silence between two movements of thought. There is silence of an evening. When the birds have made their noise, chattering, and have gone to bed, and there isn't a fluttering among the leaves, there is no breeze, there is absolute quietness. Not in a city, but when you are out with nature, when you are among the trees, or sitting on the banks of a river, the silence d- descends on the earth, and you are part of that silence. So there are different kinds of silence. But the silence we are talking about the quietness of a mind. That silence is not to be bought, is not to be practised, is not so- something you gain, a reward, a compensation to an ugly life. It's only when the ugly life has been transformed into the good life the good I mean not having plenty, but the life of goodness, the flowering of that goodness, the beauty. Then now the silence comes. And also you have to inquire what is beauty? I'm afraid in this country you have lost touch with nature. The 
they were in your books. <coughs> Nature is mentioned. You, the modern man, here sitting there, you have lost touch with nature. And therefore, because having lost touch with nature, you have also lost touch with man, with, a, with your neighbour. So you have to find out what beauty is. What is beauty? Have you ever gone into this question? Or will you find it in a book and tell me or tell each other the, that book says what beauty is? What is beauty? Did you look at the sunset this evening as you are sitting there? The sunset was behind the speaker. Did you look at it? Did you feel the light and the glory of, of that light on a leaf? Or do you think beauty is sensory, sensuous, and a mind that is seeking sacred things of, cannot be a, attracted to beauty? cannot have anything with beauty, because beauty implies the woman in this country. Therefore, suppress it. Therefore, only concentrate on your little image which you have projected from your own thought as the good. So you have to find out. If you want to find out what meditation is, you have to find out what beauty is. Beauty in the face, beauty in character. Not character. Character is a cheap thing that depends on your environmental reaction, and the cultivation of that reaction is called character. The beauty of action, the beauty of behaviour, conduct, the inward beauty, the beauty of you, the way you walk, the way you talk, the way you gesture, all that is beauty. And without having that, Meditation becomes merely an escape, a compensation, a meaningless action. And there is beauty in frugality, there is beauty in great austerity, not the austerity of the sannyasi. The austerity of a mind that has order, the mind that has understood the, the disorder it, it lives in, as you do, the disorder. And out of the disorder you create a pattern of order. And that's not order. Order comes when you understand the whole disorder in which you live, and the understanding of that disorder, out of that disorder, comes naturally order, which is virtue. Therefore, virtue, order, is supreme austerity, not the denial of a three meals a day, or fasting, or shaving your head, and all the rest of that business. So there is order, which is beauty, 
There is order, there is beauty of love, beauty of compassion, and also there is the beauty of a clean street, of a good architectural form of a building. There is beauty of a tree, the lovely leaf, the great big branches, to see all that is beauty. Not merely go to museums and talk everlastingly about beauty. So, silence of a quiet mind is the essence of that beauty. And because it is silent, and because it is not the plaything of thought, then in that silence there comes that which is indestructible, which is sacred. And in the coming of that which is sacred, then life becomes sacred, your life becomes sacred. Our relationship becomes sacred. Everything becomes sacred, because you have touched that thing which is sacred. The fourth extract is from the fourth talk in Ojai, 1978, titled Beauty and Desire. If you have observed may most of the religions have said deny desire, control desire, subjugate desire, deny desire in the service of God. The monks throughout the world of different colours have said, don't have desire. But when you deny desire, suppress desire, you give it has greater strength, greater vitality. And so inwardly burning with desire, outwardly have a calm face. Read the book, don't look at a woman, don't look at the beauty of the world, the nature, the marvellous earth, because that might awaken desire. So don't concern yourself, you're a monk, look at anything but the book. And when you do look at a woman, Consider her as your sister, your mother, anything but what she is. This has been the way of the monks throughout the world. But we are not saying suppress, control, deny, run away from desire. On the contrary, we are trying to understand the nature of and when one has comprehended fully its structure and its nature, then it has its right place, then it isn't, doesn't fulfil the horizon, your whole life. Therefore there is neither denying it nor suppressing. So it's important to understand the nature of desire, what is desire. Surely desire is a reaction from a stimulus. The stimulus is when you see something. In the shop window, when you see a woman or a boy, 
or a man, or a beautiful car, or a dress and so on. So, desire arises through perception, seeing. Please observe it for yourself. It's not because I say so. Through seeing, then contact, then sensation, then thought creates out of that sensation the image. And that very creation of that image is desire. Right? Please don't accept what the, what the speaker is saying. Observe it in yourself. You see a beautiful dress, shirt, trouser, whatever it is. And seeing it, touching it, then the contact, the sensation, and thought creating the image of you wearing it and desire arising. Right? Please, as we said, this is not analysis. This is observation. When you observe, analysis has no place. When you observe the movement of sensation, the sensation, whether it be sexual, whether it be any kind of sensation, arises through seeing, the optical seeing, the observation, the contact, the sensation, and the image-making. That is the whole movement of desire. Right? But the problem is, that movement demands fulfilment, demands that you should I gain what it wants, should, uh, should buy or whatever it desires. Now, the problem is, Where does thought come in and make it into a desire, into that desire demanding fulfilment? Where does, where does thought come in between? You understand my question? I must make it clear. You see a beautiful car. I'm taking the car. Maybe a woman, maybe a man, maybe a marvelous picture, piece of furniture, piece of <coughs> jewel, whatever it is. You see a car. Then the track, the contact with it. The sensation to own it. Sensation. And thought say, creates the image you sitting in the car and driving it. Then the whole problem arises that whether thought can with separate itself from sensation. I wonder if I'm this is clear. No, it's not. I'll make it a little more clear. You see the car. Sensation. And 
these are you sit in the car driving it and if you can't get haven't got enough money to buy a car you are jealous you are anxious you want to you do all kinds of things you steal cars i believe that's the latest you know that's going on in this whole country so the problem arises when the de- when desire demands fulfillment right as you see a beautiful woman or a beautiful man sex urge all the rest of it the desire always wanting its fulfillment the desire may is constant it may vary the objects of desire may vary but desire is constant i don't know if you follow this and then the struggle begins i must not desire i must desire the edict of religions if you pay attention to that kind of thing anymore or you because you desire you fulfill whatever you want this permissiveness of this country which is spreading unfortunately throughout the world you are setting the standard unfortunately so this constant struggle to fulf- to uh, to do whatever the desire demands it may bring pain it may bring satisfaction it may bring pleasure it may bring all kinds of things but there is constant struggle where there is struggle there is expenditure of energy right so the monks have said don't waste that energy therefore withhold desire that energy is necessary to serve god whatever it is jesus christ and all the rest of it all put together by thought I'm sorry. I'm, we're speaking next to a church. So, how to prevent the conflict is the question. You understand? Desire is always creating conflict. you may be satisfied with one fulfillment of a desire but that satisfaction demands more so there's constant pressure constant drive which brings about great deal of conflict the question then is is it possible to prevent this conflict because one realizes conflict is a wastage of energy when you are related with another man woman to be in conflict with each other is so futile meaningless and in the same way one must find out whether this wastage of energy through conflict which desire inevitably brings about whether that conflict can end my i this clear i can go on how does this conflict arise in the movement of desire are we together in this please we are understanding each other some of you perhaps will some of you don't does matter it's up to you we are asking where does conflict arise in desire observation sensation 
contact sensation. If that stops there, then there is no conflict. Right? I wonder if you see that. You see the car, contact, sensation. That's normal, natural. You see a beautiful thing, beautiful mountain, beautiful trees, lovely morning, the sensation. But thought says, I wish this, day, such a beautiful day, could continue tomorrow without rain. So, is it possible, please listen, is it possible to so, to be so alertly aware for sensation to stop and not let thought interfere with it? Right? That is, have you ever observed the sea or the mountains or your friend or your boy or girl with total awakening for all the senses, not just the eyes or the ears, with, with all your senses to observe. I wonder if you have ever done it. Then you will see there is no division between the observer and the observed. I want the That is, when you observe totally with your heart, with your mind, with your eyes, with your ears, with all the senses awakened, with all the senses observing, then there is no desire as thought interfering with sensation. I wonder if you all see this. Do try now, as we are sitting there, to observe, doesn't matter what, the tree, with all your senses, not only with your eyes, If you do, the sensation of seeing the colours, the sparkling leaves in the sun, the clarity of the blue sky, the sensation, if you so completely observe, there is no centre from which you desire. The final extract this week is from a recording by Krishnamurti in Ojai, 1983, titled A New Day Has Begun, Full of Beauty. It's a new day. The sun won't be up for another hour or so. It's quite dark and the trees are silent. waiting for the dawn and the sun to rise behind the hills. There ought to be a prayer for dawn. It comes so slowly, penetrating the whole world, And here, in this quiet, secluded house, surrounded by orange trees and few flowers, 
is extraordinarily quiet. There are no birds as yet singing their morning song. The world is asleep, at least in this part of this world. Far from all civilization, the noise, the brutality, the vulgarity, and the talk of politicians. Slowly, with great patience, The dawn begins in the deep silence of the night is broken by the morning dove and the hoot of an owl. There are several owls here. They're calling to each other. And the hills and the trees are beginning to awaken. In silence, the dawn begins, gets lighter and lighter, and the dew is on the leaf, and the sun is just climbing over the hill. The first rays of the sun are caught in those tall trees, in that old oak that has been there for a very, very long time. And the morning now begins with its soft mournful call. And across the road, across the orange trees, there is a peacock calling. Even in this part of the world, there are peacocks, at least. There are few of them. And the day has begun. It's a wonderful day. It's so new, so fresh, so alive and full of beauty. It's a new day without any past remembrances without the call of another. There is a great wonder when one looks at all the beauty, those bright oranges with their dark leaves and a few flowers bright in their glory. One wonders at this extraordinary light which only this part of the world seems to have. One wonders as one looks at the creation which seems to have no beginning and no end. A creation not by cunning thought, but the creation of a new morning. This morning is as it never been before, so bright, so clear. There's a squirrel 
long bushy tail, quivering nose, and shy. In the old pepper tree, he lost many branches. He was getting old. He must have seen many storms. As the oak, not patient the old age, quiet, with great dignity. It's a new morning, full of ancient life. It has no time, no problem. It exists, and that in itself is a miracle. It's a new morning without any memory, and all the past days are over, gone, and the sun now is over the hill, covering the earth, and it too has no yesterday. The tree, the sun, and the flowers have no time. It is the miracle of a new day. It 